Welcome. I am Heather Pierce Campbell, the legal website warrior. I'm an attorney and legal coach based here in Seattle, Washington. Welcome to another episode of Guts, Grit, and Great Business. I am so excited about our guest today. We are new friends. We actually met through a mastermind group and I've got Aaron Walker here with us today. Hello, Aaron. Hey, Heather. Thanks for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, so good to have you. I'm really excited about our conversation. So for people listening, Aaron is a mastermind expert. It's a huge component of what he does in his business. Um, but before we get into that, let me introduce Aaron. So Aaron Walker has founded more than a dozen companies over the last 41 years. He attributes much of his success to having surrounded himself with his mastermind counterparts. Aaron spent a decade meeting weekly with Dave Ramsey, Dan Miller, Ken Abraham, and five other amazing entrepreneurs. Aaron is the founder of Iron Sharpens Iron, and I love your business name, by the way, um, Iron Sharpens Iron Mastermind, that now hosts 15 groups with national and international members. Aaron is the author of View from the Top, a must read to fully understand how to live a life of success and significance. Also the founder of the Mastermind Playbook, an incredible resource for starting, running, and scaling masterminds. Aaron lives in Nashville, Tennessee with his wife, Robin, of 40 years and has two incredible daughters and five beautiful grandchildren. And I have to include this one line from his LinkedIn profile. I'm a big LinkedIn connector and I love some good time on LinkedIn, but Aaron has this in his summary. He says, I can teach you the values of combining grit, determination, and perseverance to achieve your goals in your business, spiritual, and personal life. My experiences, personal motivation, and inspiration will help you to do your very best. I love that, Aaron. Welcome. Well, thank you. You know, I'm not the sharpest tack in the box, but I've got a lot of perseverance and grit and determination that has really gotten us to the point where we're at today. So, well, you and, and I it ties are great with your name, you know, guts and grit. Uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about, Heather. Yes, I do know what you're talking about. And I've said the same thing. Like I, you know, I think I'm pretty sharp, but I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed either. And, but grit, I mean, what has seen me through many of the very, very hardest times in my life is just the fact that, you know, I, I tend to persevere. I tend to just drive and drive and drive. And usually when, you know, I ask people to choose one word to describe me, it's determination. So those words that you have on your LinkedIn profile, I mean, I, I appreciate them. I relate to them. I think that in business and the entrepreneurial path, the most important work that you can do is actually just stay committed. Yeah, no question about it. You know, and I've really had to do that. People ask me how come I've got so much grit is because I was broken a convict when I was a kid. You know, I was uh, raised in a family that didn't have the means and the wherewithal uh, to do business like I wanted to do business. And I had to go out and seek partners to start our first business. And, uh, you know, I didn't get many opportunities and I had to make good of the opportunities that I got. And so, you know, when I was 13 years old, I started working in a local pawn shop and then at 15 decided that's what I wanted to do for a living. And at 18, I opened my own and I said, uh, Hey, you know, you got to get out and make it while you can. And then we sold out to a fortune 500 when I was 27, nine years later. And so it took a lot of grit and determination to do that. You know, I didn't go to college. Matter of fact, I graduated two years early from high school so I could work. And so you know, from the beginning of my junior year in high school, I wanted to make money and I wanted to work and I wanted to be successful. And now looking back, you know, that was 12 businesses ago, four decades ago. And uh, today we're getting to live a life that we really enjoy because of that grit and determination. Yeah. Oh, I love that. What, what do you think was behind that level of hustle to be a teenager and to really yeah. like have you know, the drive and the ability to make a decision that that is what you were going to do at that age. What, what was behind it? Yeah. You know, Heather, I, as I said earlier, I was raised in a family that didn't really have anything. We had 600 square foot house. There were six people that lived in it. Uh, my dad gave $6,500 for the house that we lived in. And then quite honestly, we later lost it in bankruptcy and had to move in with my cousin. And I watched my dad physically work hard. He was a carpenter and 
I saw him sweep the roof, the snow off of a roof during the winter so he could re-roof the house. And it did something to me when I saw that. I said, you know, this is really admirable of my dad to do that, but I don't want to work that hard physically. I don't want to do that. And I said, there's got to be another way. And so I just started surrounding myself with competent people and uh, started looking for people that could give me good advice. And uh, I ask a lot of questions. Even today, I ask a lot of questions because it's not really important to me what you necessarily think about me. What's important to me is that I get ahead and I do the right things. I do it with character and I do it with integrity. And my dad did teach me that. He taught me to have a great amount of character and integrity and And so I just said that there's got to be a different way. And so I committed to working hard. I got married two weeks out of high school. My wife was 18 just by three months and I was 19 and we got married and I said, we can't screw this up. We may never get another chance. And so we borrowed $150,000 from two guys and we opened our business. It was a 10 year loan and I set Robin down and we bought a little one bedroom condo, 500 square feet and we lived in it. And I said, we're going to take every bit of the money that we make in this business and we're going to pay towards that loan. We could increase our lifestyle and we could do better, but we're not going to do that. Well, I paid the loan off in 36 months. And so we had a paid for business when I was 21 years old. And then I said, well, if I did it once, I can do it again. And we did. And then we did it again. And then we did it again. And so by the time I was 27, a Fortune 500 contacted me, wanted to buy our business. And I told them it wasn't for sale. And they said, everything's for sale. And uh, they came back three times wanting to buy the business. And finally, they said, hypothetically, if you were going to ever sell it, what would you sell it for? And I thought, well, this is my opportunity to get rid of them. And I just threw a number out. And they said, we'll take it. And to make a long story short, 90 days later, I was retired at 27 years old. And I don't say that boastfully. I just say that anybody can do it. You can do it. Anybody can do it if you're willing to work like we did. And we worked from daylight until we couldn't. And then we got up and did it again. And it's the consistency. And that's the piece that most people miss. And there is that grit and determination in me to not quit. And now there's some things that we have to quit if it's just not working. But overall, if you stay with something long enough, you're going to gain momentum, you're going to have that critical mass, and then you're going to be successful. The trick is, is doing it every day, whether you feel like it or not. And so that's what we did. And we repeated that 11 additional times. Today, we're on our 14th business. And uh, it just works. If you're willing to sacrifice, you're willing to delay gratification, you're willing to do the hard things, it'll pay off. Mm, I love that. What, where along the way did you make the transition to what you're doing now, right? With the focus on masterminds, where did that yeah. come in and, and talk to me about how masterminds became an interest? For yeah, you. thank you. I'll have to take you back and tell you a little bit of a story that I don't like, uh, but it's, um, it's, it's an interval part of my story. So when I was 27 and sold out, uh, I literally retired and in 18 months, I gained 50 pounds and I was getting in the bed in the middle of the day. And my wife woke me up one day from a nap. I was literally in the bed and she said, this is not what I signed up for. And she said, you've got to do something. And I said, well, I don't know what to do. She said, go buy another business, start a business. I don't care, but you, you got to do something. And so I went back and bought the company I started with when I was 13 years old. And we grew the company four times the size it was. I had the resources to put into the business and we did extremely well. My life was amazing. Just to be honest with you, I worked three days a week. My partner worked three days a week and we grew the company four times the size it was. Well, August 1st, 2001, 19 years ago, I was headed to the office. I had always gone to our church every Wednesday morning and with a group of men, we met and prayed for our families and prayed for our church and just prayed for our community. And we did that every Wednesday morning and we did that for years. And I had left there at 730 in the morning and I was headed to the office and there was a guy crossing the street ahead of me uh, to catch a local bus. And when I got to him, he didn't look my way and he ran out in front of me to catch the bus. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, I ran, I ran over him and, uh, 
So I pulled over to the side of the road and I was shaking, you know, really bad. And I, I was scared to turn around and look. And I said, God, this is, can't be true. I mean, it's like a dream. And Heather, I don't know if you've ever been in a really bad situation or not, but it was almost like I was watching it out of body experience. Everything was in slow motion and I didn't know what to do. And so finally I got the courage to turn around and look and there was a guy face down in the street. Cars were stopping everywhere. It was a four lane highway. And I got my cell phone and uh, finally dialed 911 and got out of the car and I walked over police, ambulance, fire trucks, people were coming from everywhere. And he was motionless. This guy was motionless. And I said, please tell me he's okay. You know, and they said he's got severe head trauma. And so they put him on the gurney and they put me in the police car, obviously. And they had to ask me questions and they had testimonies of everybody. And it wasn't my fault. He didn't see me. He just ran out in front of me. His name was Enrique. He was 77 years old. He was originally from the Philippines. And they called, that was on a Wednesday morning. And they called me nine o'clock on Saturday morning. And they said he didn't make it. And it rocked my world. I mean, literally, my life was amazing. I had a beautiful home. We had a second home in the mountains. You know, I had the resources I needed. I was working three days a week. I had two beautiful daughters at the time that were, you know, teenage daughters. And my life was just amazing. And I said, how could this happen? Like, like how could all this happen in a blink of an eye? Just absolutely in a blink of an eye. And what I discovered through that process, and I don't mean to take your audience down, but the truth of the matter is it was a, a paramount time. There was a paramount shift in my life that happened at that time. What I had realized, Heather, is I'd had great financial success, but I had no significance. And I started thinking about what if I'd been killed that day? I was 40 years old. What if it had been me? What would my legacy have been? I said, my legacy would have been poor kid from Nashville, Tennessee, makes enough money to retire at age 27 and nobody cares. Mm -hmm. And it made me sad. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was extremely sad when I thought about my legacy being that. And I said, that's not what I want my legacy to be. I want my legacy to be Heather's life is better as a result of having known me. I was able to help her and inspire her and encourage her. That's what I wanted my legacy to be. Mm -hmm. And so I said, God, if you'll give me another chance, I'll change the way I do business. And I did. I started focusing outward more than inward. And I started helping people accomplish their goals. And I became the connector. And I started helping people and encouraging them. And I had people that worked for me that I helped go into business against me. They became my competitors, but I helped them physically went to their locations and help them set up their business. And as a result of that, when you're a giver, the natural reciprocity is everybody else wants to help you, right? We think that we hide the secret sauce and we don't tell anybody, get you ahead. There's nothing further from the truth. When you really try to help people, they want to do things. They want to be around you and you can be the beacon. You can be the person that helps. And so that's what I elected to do 20 years ago. So as a result of that, we started other businesses and they were very successful. Well, when I turned 50, 10 years later, I retired for the third and final time, I thought. And Dave Ramsey and Dan Miller looked at me and they said, what are you going to do now? And I said, I'm going to go to the Caribbean and I'm going to buy a little tiki hut and I'm going to sit on the front porch and look at the ocean and rock myself into an oblivion. And Dan Miller, those that know Dan, Dan owns 48 Days to the Work You Love. He's a very successful coach and written a number of books. He leaned over the table and he looked at me and he pointed his finger and he said, that's the most selfish thing I've ever heard you say. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, what you're saying is, is I've got enough for myself. Good luck to the rest of you. And I said, that's not at all what I mean. And they said, you need to coach. So after a long conversation about coaching, I, I agreed to do it. Went to Entree Leadership Mastery. Dave gifted it to me. Went to the sanctuary. Learned how to coach through Innovate. And then I started coaching two guys. Well, I started doing podcast interviews to promote my coaching business. And Heather, it just blew up. John Lee Dumas had me on Entrepreneur on Fire years ago. And I had 15 clients out of that one interview. And I said, I can't 
coach all these people individually. And I'd been in Dave Ramsey's mastermind for a dozen years. And I said, I know how to do masterminds. And so I started a mastermind group, kept doing podcast interviews. And here today, we're about to launch our 19th mastermind group. We're about to create a new division with 15 other groups in that as well. And I'm probably having more fun today, Heather, than I've ever had in my career because I'm helping make a difference in the lives of other people. And it's not just for my benefit. Mm. There's a lot of things I love about that story and your path. And I think, you know, first of all, one is the sense of purpose that you have now. And that probably brings you the amount of joy that you're getting out of your work. And I think a lot of people feel like if they don't have that at first, like if they, you know, that they're not going to get there. If they don't have that sense of purpose, they don't know how they're going to figure it out. And what I love about your story, I actually just read a book the other day on grit, right? Angela Duckworth's book. But yeah. So that's a great I, TED talk too, by the way. Yeah, it is a great TED yeah. talk for anybody listening. You definitely should check out her TED talk. Um, but in the book, she talks about how people usually start from a place of self-interest right? Sure. They usually start with something they're interested in. Sure. They learn it and they master it. And then at some point they transition when they're, when they're truly in their purpose and they find their purpose, they're able to transition that what originally started as a self-interest and then became mastery to then how do they serve others? And so yeah. the thing I love about your path is it's another reflection of that development and kind of the natural way that things happen. And for people that are listening, what I want them to hear out of that is that if they haven't yet determined what their purpose is, if they haven't yet figured it out, like, don't give up. There's, there's so many ways right. that you can attach meaning to your work and take something that maybe started from a self-interest into serving others. Heather, I want to expound on that just a little bit, if I may. Uh, I don't necessarily think that your purpose has to be derived out of your occupation. And most people think it has to be. A lot of people have a job and they're whatever, you fill in the blank. What kind of purpose can you get out of that? See, I believe that our occupation can be the source of the revenue to live the life that you were created to live and find your purpose in other areas. So don't necessarily just attach your purpose in life to your occupation. No, and it's a good clarifying point. I agree. And I think that our occupation is one way that we can express our purpose, but it's not the only way. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's a, you know, resources are tools that we use to live a very productive life. Mm -hmm. And many people may have a job that they don't necessarily gain their purpose out of, but there are many other areas of your life that you can gain a significant purpose out of uh, using the resources that you gain from your occupation. Absolutely. Agreed. Agreed. So let's look at where you're at now. And you said you get, you know, you're getting way more enjoyment out of your work right now. How did you go from the one to many approach, right? You got overloaded with work. You're now running right. masterminds in, you know, 15 countries around the world. Right. Well, the thing, the thing that I discovered quickly is because I've got a lot of business experience and no knock on coaches because I'm a coach, but a coach is not a business. A coach is a high paying job. And when you're not coaching, you're not making money. And so the mastermind, I just got off of a two week vacation, uh, went with Robin, we completely unplugged and celebrated our 40th anniversary. Congratulations. And, uh, thank you, I appreciate that. And when I got back, we had new applicants to join the mastermind group and all the revenue uh, was still there. So I didn't miss any revenue because the mastermind groups continued because, you know, I appointed facilitators to lead the groups while I was away. And so it's not hinged just on me as an individual. It's the consensus of the multitude, right? It's the group. The benefit is in the group, in the 10 people that are in the group. So it's not group coaching. It doesn't rest just on my shoulders, mm -hmm. but I create the framework by which we allow people to mastermind and so that is a business. And so I've creating revenue in perpetuity 
right? We've got people that have been with us six years that have been paying, meeting in the same group. And one day, because of the framework that we've established, I'll be able to sell this business. Well, coaching, I realized I couldn't do that. One day I would just quit coaching, the money would go away, and so would I. And so I said, I don't want to devote my time, effort, and energy to something that there's going to be no return because I'm used to selling businesses that are a going concern and then you're able to get revenue and you're able to, you know, have a, a, a really big payday at the end or you can finance the business. And I wanted something that I would be able to do that with. Hmm. No, I love that. Well, and you came with the business experience, right? And right, applied right. it to this particular area and, and focus. So within your mastermind groups, what, what are people using it for? Is it across all areas of life? Like how do you create sure. a framework that supports everybody who participates? Well, we started being pretty successful and some of the um, influencers started reaching out to me saying, no one's ever scaled masterminds. How are you doing this? Surely you're not leading all these groups. And so one guy from Dubai called me and noticed what we were doing. And he said, how in the world are you scaling all these masterminds? And I started telling him a little bit and he said, would, would you coach me and teach me to do that? And I didn't really want to do that, to be honest, because I knew it was going to be time consuming. And he kept on. And finally, he said, if you were going to charge me to coach me, how much would you charge? And I didn't want to do it. So I threw a big number out and he said, where do I send the money? And so I said, you really want to do this, don't you? And he said, yeah. So he sent me the money. And then wasn't too long. Someone else called me back, same proposition. And I quoted a number and they said, yeah, we'll do it. Well, my daughter, Brooke, uh, is the COO of our company. And she walked in my office one day and she said, dad, we've got all the systems and processes that we run our business by. Why don't we create a playbook and we'll allow other people to do exactly what we're doing. We'll start training and teaching the very thing that you are accustomed to because you want to give back. So we took us about a year, took our entire team about a year. We hired a product developer and copywriters and graphic artists and designers and uh, managers, and we put together the playbook. And so now we have the mastermind playbook and there's about 11 steps. Uh, there's about a hundred tools and templates, uh, swap files, 35 videos in this professionally done. And we teach people to start, grow and scale mastermind groups and people are having huge success with this. And so we've established a framework to answer your question. Everything that we do monthly is thematic. And then we have a book that coincides with the theme. And then we have an accountability tool, things that are very important in our life. There's 10 things that we have to answer each week. Every group is structured the same in regards to the hot seat. We call it the man in the middle. We have the book discussion twice a year. I get everybody together at my expense and I bring them to Nashville, Tennessee from all the countries and from the states here locally and all across the U.S. And we have a mastermind meetup for two and a half days and we do that every six months. And we've been doing that for years and years now. And then we go back with our assignment. We do Brian Moran's The 12 Week Year. We do Mike McCallowitz, The Prophet First. And so we have all these systems in place that get people on the path that they need to go in order to be successful. We have accountability partners that we assign every single month. Uh, and so we're very structured, very regimented. People's time is valuable. Uh, we have people that are barely afford to pay their dues and we have other people that are uber successful that have really grown their business because Heather, you know, as well as I do, when there's a group of like-minded people around that have the same core values and principles and mission and your values, uh, you're apt to go much further than alone because isolation is the enemy to excellence. And if you really want to go to the next height, You've got to surround yourself with people that can help take you there. We were designed to be in community. We weren't designed to be alone. And so I need people around me, and I'm sure you do, Heather, that give you input. We all have superpowers. We all have Achilles heel, and we all have blind spots. Well, I can't see my blind spots, and I know that's the thing that's going to harm me the most. And so I subject myself to the scrutiny of other people and invite their constructive criticism so I can get better. And as a result of that, our people are just growing exponentially because we have that weekly 
meet and the weekly accountability. Mm, I love that. There's, I mean, there's a couple things that you have said. One is that, um, you know, we're really not designed to do stuff in isolation. And yet, how many times do entrepreneurs find themselves there? Right. Well, they don't have anybody to ask. And that's one of the main things that masterminds give you is a new perspective. And it gives you someone else's. I talked to Jeff Hoffman. Jeff Hoffman was one of the founders of Priceline. And he's a multi-billionaire. And he spoke at an event. uh, And I was able to go to the event. And he said that 10% of everything he reads has no bearing whatsoever with any interest that he has. Yet he said 90% of his best ideas came out of the 10% of the things that he wasn't accustomed to reading. Well, it's the same in a mastermind group. See, we don't know what we don't know. Mm. And then when we can see it from a different perspective, you're thinking, what application can I make to my situation with that perspective? And then oftentimes I have a new idea every time I get out of the shower, right? I get out of the shower and I've got three ideas and I would go to my mastermind group and I would go, man, let me tell y'all what I'm thinking. And Dave Ramsey would go, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Or Dan Miller would say, wait a minute, if we do this and we make this modification and I'm like, I didn't even know you could do that. He said, yeah, I've got this guy I need to introduce you to that can help you modify that. And I'm like, man, if I hadn't have been in this group, Dave wouldn't have told me it was a stupid thing. Dan wouldn't have encouraged me to do this, nor would he have introduced me to somebody. And then they go, hey, next week, you need to have this done before you come back. Well, now I don't want to go in there and look like a loser. So I'm going to do it. Well, you know what happens when you do things? You become successful. And so every week, see, procrastination is our biggest enemy. And if you have no accountability and you have no persons that are trusted advisors around you, you kick the can down the road. And the next thing you know, you've lost momentum, you've lost interest, and you're on to the next shiny object. Well, for me, I've been able to really narrow my focus and be an inch wide and a mile deep rather than an inch deep and a mile wide. I have a plan that's written, and I know that if I implement my strategy every day, I'm going to gain momentum, and then I'm going to be successful because I've reached a critical mass. And so that's the reason I need people around me to help me accomplish my goals. Well, and it sounds like early on, because you made a statement earlier in the interview about you didn't, you, you cared less about what people thought of you. Not, right? in, not in an egotistical, arrogant no, no, no. kind of I way. I got that. Yeah. Like that just right. wasn't your concern because you were on your path trying to do a certain thing. And so right. you were willing right. to ask the questions. You were willing to get the sure. feedback, right? Sure. And I think that's what it takes is either a certain level of humility or openness to get that feedback. So that well, there's like transparency, you right? You've got to be transparent and you've got to say, Hey, I don't know what I don't know. And you can't know everything, but most people have a facade. They've got this veil up and they don't want you to know that they don't know. And then they can't go be successful because they really don't know. And I'm like, Hey, I don't understand. I don't get it. Help me understand. And then when I understand, I'm like, oh, I can apply that to this. Well, people are afraid that if you say, I don't know, that they won't be around you. What it does is it endears you to other people. Really what it does is they go, oh, well, he doesn't know everything either. It gives me permission now to say, I don't know. You see, the facilitators need to be vulnerable and authentic. Heather, here's the thing. Our nation is starving to death for authenticity. They're tired of the polished They're tired of the hypocrisy. They're tired of the lying. And I I do videos all the time and I do interviews all the time and I'll go, I just don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Or, Hey, I do know I've got 41 years of experience in that. And people tell me all the time, you know, these guys have been married five or 10 years. They'll say, I'm going to go home and tell my wife this. I say, you're hiding to be sleeping on the couch too. (laughs) And here's what you need to do with your wife. Cause I've got four decades of experience. Okay. I've, I'm not the first rodeo here. Here's what you need to do. And they'll come back and they'll go, man, you know what? That really worked. And that's what we need to surround ourselves with. We need to surround ourselves with people that you can be honest and transparent and get great feedback. That's right. Well, and there is to that point, there is something magical about a mastermind when it's done right, that allows people to drop you know, drop the regular barriers or facades that they hold up because they think that that's how they have to be. So your masterminds then are, it sounds like are for people that are really wanting to learn masterminds and turn around and do that in their own. No, not necessarily. Uh, No, we have almost 200 people in our mastermind groups now. 
and we have women, we have emerging men, we have men, groups of just men, groups of just women. Uh, my daughter and my wife uh, and another lady are leading the women's groups and doing an unbelievable job. It's incredible what they're accomplishing out of that. We started with just a men's group. Mm -hmm. My wife came to one of the live events and she said, we got to do something for the women. I so love they that. Started I was going to ask group. you about that. Oh, it's incredible. They're killing it now. It is just really amazing. And a lot of the guys that are in the men's groups are getting their wives to join. And you can imagine, you know, how much they're growing now as a family, as a result of everybody growing, you know, personally and professionally and even spiritually in some cases. Mm -hmm. And so it's just incredible. We spend about 60% of the time professionally about 30% of the time personally and about 10% of the time spiritually. And so we really try to cover every area of your life because I can teach you how to make money, right? It's not that hard to make money, but if you do it at the expense of your family, you still go home a loser. And we just don't want people to do that. I don't want you to come home with a pocket full of money to a house full of strangers. Mm -hmm. And what happens is you'll die a rich old guy with no relationships. And I almost did that. I got so involved in making money when I was young, just another store, just another $50,000. I can do it. And it almost cost me my family. And I said, man, I only get one go through with these kids. I've got a daughter 37 and one thirty-five. I want to know my kids. I want my kids to go. My dad was the best dad. My dad was available. My dad was always there. I don't want my kids to go. You know, my dad was rich. But he was never at my ball games. He was never at my recitals. He was never at my cheerleading practice. It's just not worth it to me because you only have one go through with that family. I can make money. I can lose money. Nobody cares. Nobody's got a memory. But my kids do and my wife does. And I just don't want to sacrifice uh, everything at the altar of money at the expense mm -hmm. of my family. And so we really teach family values and the importance of being home, being present, being with your kids, uh, because they do have a memory and they're going to remember mom or dad was at work. They never had time for me. And Heather, I don't know about you. I just don't want to have that regret. And we really teach that strongly. Oh, well, it's, you know, it's great that you incorporate that into your training. I mean, so many people get that backwards and they, they learn that lesson too late. I mean, I come from an industry full of that struggle, right? I mean, and I don't know what comes first, the chicken or the egg, like are work workaholics drawn to the legal industry or does the legal industry, you know, take a type yeah. A behavior and then shape them as well. And, um, but it's tough. People, I mean, people learn that lesson too late. And so to have it built into your messaging yeah. and address balance early on, I think is critical. Well, we need boundaries. Henry Cloud wrote a great book called Boundaries and we need to create boundaries. And, uh, I know we're getting towards the end of our time, but I want to leave you with a quick story. I did do one thing right. I didn't do everything wrong, but I did do one thing right. When my children were little, all, I've never worked for anybody since I was 18 years old, and I'll be mm -hmm. 60 my next birthday. I told everybody that worked for me, if my wife or my daughters call, I'm available. I don't care what I'm doing, I'm available. And I want to encourage your listeners today, if you can, and if you work for yourself, and if you work for somebody else, that's not always possible. But if you work for yourself, I want you to adopt that same strategy. Because my girls tell me today, and they've got beautiful children and very successful in what they're doing now. And they said, Dad, you were always available. And that's made a lasting impression on them. And I can't imagine having the regret of having to redo something that I can't redo. I can't raise them again. Right. And so I'll just leave you with that today is really get your priorities, right? Prioritize your priorities and really think about what's important to you. You can say audibly what's important, but your actions speak really loud. And I just want you to implement the strategy of what you say audibly to implementation and really prioritize your priorities. Mm, I love that. I mean, it's a great point to end on that regardless of what we say, what we do in our life and how we're showing up, I mean, that, that says it all. And so sure. for people that have misalignment between what they say and how they perform and how they show up, you know, we've got a chance to reevaluate. So I'm so grateful to have you here today. I know we've got a link to, I think maybe, um, a, a page on your website. People can find it through my show notes, which is 
legalwebsitewarrior.com forward slash podcast. And I, I'm not sure if it's just um, a gift or a way to get connected into you. How do you like to connect, Aaron? If somebody's thinking like, yeah. hey, I'd like to know more about his mastermind experience. Yeah, the easiest way is to go to viewfromthetop.com. Mm -hmm. And I make myself very easy uh, to get in touch with. And so you go there, there's all kinds of connections there awesome. on social media. Uh, my email is there. My phone number is on there. People say, you put your phone number on there? I said, well, how do people call you if you don't put your phone number out there? And so I'm really easy to get in contact with. And if you want to create your own mastermind, that sounds like something that's exciting to you. You can go to themastermindplaybook.com and really check into the playbook that we've created to grow, scale, and maintain mastermind groups like we have. And I think it would be very beneficial to you. Heather, it's been awesome. a real delight to be with you today. Thank you for having me on your show. It's so good to see you, Aaron. I will share both your, your mastermind playbook link as well as all of your other contact links on the show notes. So people will hopefully get in touch and reach out. So appreciate your wisdom and being with us today. I look forward to connecting again soon. Thank you. We'll see hey, you. Bye-bye.